Okay, let's get into our time of study. Romans, I didn't, yeah, I put it up there. Romans chapter 1, speaking of the book of Romans, that's where we're going to start. We're continuing our uh, sanctification series. Now, this might be the last message. Um, if it is, two weeks from now, that's the next time we meet on Wednesday. Uh, is that the 31st? Let me do my math. Right, 14. 14. So it's the last, is, is it 31 days in January? Good. Yes. So it's the last day in January. So we'll go into February. Um, the next thing I'm going to teach on is the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Both his coming for us in the body of Christ, as well as his coming for the nation of Israel. Okay, we're going to look at both of those. So we'll, we'll look forward to that. But here on, on our study tonight, look at, uh, first, uh, look at Romans chapter 1 and verse 1. <clears throat> I'm going to read a few verses. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, Amen. by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers, making request, if by any means now at length, I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God, to come unto you. Let's pray. <clears throat> Pardon me. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for uh, the Holy Scriptures. We thank you for uh, the, the Word made flesh, your, your Son, the Lord Jesus, who came to this earth, and as the Bible says, he, he, he came and he died for our sins. We thank you for that, Father. And as Paul says in this passage, he was resurrected by the Spirit of holiness from the dead. And we thank you for his glorious resurrection for us, for our justification, Father. Mm -hmm. We thank you for this time to, tonight to get into your word with those of like precious faith and the blessing of technology to get it out to others. We ask that this, is, uh, this study is both gives us insight and wisdom, and most importantly, a greater appreciation of your son, the Lord Jesus. It's in his wonderful name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, what I want to look at tonight is, according as, as we have up here, we began looking at sanctification. And what it was last time, or what it is, but that's what we saw last time. Uh, that's already posted as well. What we're going to look at, look at tonight is why we are sanctified, and the reason God left us here. And what we're going to see is that the process of sanctification, the process of sanctification is designed by God in order to equip us to worship and serve Him. I'll say it one more time. God has designed sanctification to equip us to worship and serve him. We really don't know how to worship God unless he tells us how. And the way we learn how to worship God is through being set apart by his holy word. His word is going to tell us how to both worship him and serve him. I want you to see that true worship is manifested through service. That's what we're going to see today. If you look at our passage, look at Romans chapter 1 and verse 1. <clears throat> The first verse of Paul's epistles sets the tone. Uh, on the radio, I forgot to put that on the board, but uh, every Sunday, 930, we're on wilkinsradio.com, and you can listen to 10 Minutes in the Word. Um, I'm starting off with this verse as a springboard to teach about the Apostle Paul. And if you look at verse 1, it says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separating unto the gospel of God. And in that one verse, it sets the tone for all of Paul's epistles. Uh, who is the one whom Christ has sent to teach us? Paul. And what is he? he? He is first a servant. Even before he's an apostle, he's a servant. And notice, the first verse of Paul's epistles shows you what God wants us to be, servants. A servant of Jesus Christ and in and, and his, and his servanthood, he's called to be an apostle. And not just an apostle, our apostle. The mm -hmm. apostle of and to us Gentiles, Romans eleven thirteen, 13. And, and he's the apostle of us Gentiles. And notice he's mm -hmm. separated unto the gospel of God. He's separated from both Jew and Gentile, and his God sends them to us. And that issue of the gospel of God 
That has to do with the good news of the resurrection of his son. When you think about the gospel of God, everything that God does, every gospel, every, all the good news God has is based upon his son, Jesus Christ, and his resurrection. He makes it all possible. But when we talk about true worship, look, at that, look, look down at verse 9. Uh, Romans 1 verse 9, for God is my witness. Paul's going to bring God to the witness stand to testify. But notice, whom I serve with my spirit. Later we're going to see more about serving with our spirit. We are, we are a soul and we possess a spirit and a body. Who we are is our soul. We possess a spirit that makes, lets us connect to other spirits, right? Holy Spirit, other human spirit. But we also have a body. And what we're going to serve, what we're going to serve God is, is in our spirit. OK, the Lord says God wants those who, who worship him in spirit and in truth. He says in John four knows what Paul says, for God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son. And we're going to look more about this service. It's a spiritual service. Uh, it's not a fleshly service, even though we do do things in our physical bodies. What God is looking for is to have our spirits uh, uh, serve him. And we'll look more at that. Um, look, look, look at verse 23. Uh, when Paul talks about the unbelievers, uh, the heathen who decided, made a choice to push God away. Well, notice what he says in verse 23. Start at verse 22. Possess, uh, professing themselves to be wise. Always, every time I read this, I think about professors. You ever see these college professors and stuff? No offense if some of our saints are. But can I tell you, those professors... They're kind of wise in their own conceits, many of them. Here he says they professed themselves to be wise, and what happened? They became fools. Fools have to do with not understanding the things of Almighty God. And verse 23, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image. That's what man does. He takes the invisible God, the glory of God, and put it into an image. Made like unto corruptible man, to birds, to four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Verse 24, wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts. See, God just gives you what you want to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Now, here's what I want you to see. Look at verse 25, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served. See, worship is to lead to service. Now, they were worshiping and serving the wrong thing, right? They worship and serve the creature. That which, which was the, 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 living, the living creation, more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. God has designed his word and the sanctification process for us believers. He's designed that to equip us to worship and serve him. If, you, if you're not sanctified in God's word, you're going to end up worshiping and serving something else. It's going to happen. Therefore, we need God's sanctification to learn to serve. And that's what we're going to look at tonight, okay? Um, the greatest example is the Lord himself. Go to Philippians chapter 2. Let me start with the Lord, and then we'll look at the Apostle Paul as well. Um, people mistakenly think that when we talk about the Apostle Paul and following him, and he's our pattern and all that, that we somehow desire to worship the Apostle Paul. That that's, can't be further from the truth. We know that the Lord Jesus Christ sent him to be his messenger to us. We know we have to go to Paul to find his inf information, the Lord's information. But it's Paul who tells us to have the same mind as the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Let, this. Let, you love it too, don't you, though? Yes. Let this mind, this is grace thinking, okay? Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Here's how he operated to the point where he went to the cross. He was willing to suffer. Humbled himself. He humbled himself. Here we go. Verse 6, who being in the form of God, he's God himself, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. As the son of God, he made himself equal with God. He was equal with God. But notice what he did, how he humbled himself. But made himself of no reputation. The wonderful thing I, I see in the Gospels, the more he, he, he wanted people to be quiet about him, the more people rang out his renown. He wasn't trying to be famous. He was ha trying to have no reputation. He'd tell, tell no one, but they'd go out and shout it because the Son of God, the Son of God uh, healed them or something. They wanted him to be known. 
But that wasn't his goal to be known. Remember what I said about Demas? Demas' name is, means popular. And Demas is with the Apostle Paul, but he forsook Paul and he loved this present world. He wanted to be popular in this world. But not the Lord Jesus. Do you know he only was known right there as far as his, where he traveled in the, in the land of Israel? He sent Paul out to the, all the Roman Empire, but the Lord Jesus, he, he, his whole life, he lived there and, 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 and served God in the land of Israel. He didn't go off all around. He, he was content to just serve his own people, the, the, people the, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. All right? But notice here in verse number seven. But made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a what? Sure. Servant. The Lord Jesus Christ became a servant, or was a servant. And I, I always remember when he got on his hands and knees, and he washed his disciples' feet. You remember that? His apostles' feet. And Peter says, no, Lord, don't do that. He says, no, I have to do it to teach you all to be servants one to another. He sanctified them over the years through the word so that they might serve one another. But Paul did it too. Go over to Philippians chapter number 2. Philippians chapter number 2. You mean 2 or 4? We're in 2 already. Oh, okay, sorry. We, we are in chapter 2. We'll go down to chapter 2. That's right. <laughs> sorry about that. Here, here, here's the point. The Lord is, 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 is the first true servant, but he also gave Paul to be our pattern. <clears throat> and as soon as Paul tells us to have that mindset, notice what he says in verse 17. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 17, Yea, See, Paul put his money where his mouth is. If he told us to do it, he did it himself. Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and, notice, service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. Paul was saying, I was willing, he's willing to be a sacrifice, a living sacrifice, and he's willing to suffer for us, for others. And I'm going to tell you, what we're going to see with service, it's, that's what it, it is. It's a suffering, it's a sacrifice. But it's serving God when we, set, when, we, when we are living sacrifices, okay? Um, that is your serving God in your spirit. Go back to Romans again, Romans chapter 1. Um, where we serve God is in the spirit. That's why religion don't work. Because religion is motivated by the flesh. In fact, Paul calls it flesh in Romans 7, right? That's religion. What well, God wants us to, to serve from our spirits Notice what Paul says over in Romans chapter 1 again. Look at verse number 9. Romans chapter 1 verse 9. For God is my witness whom I serve, what? With my spirit. It's that inner man. That's, that it's a spiritual service. And by the way, that's what he means. Go, go over to chapter 12. I'll show you uh, after he's saying. Go over to chapter 12. <clears throat> this, is a, this is a famous passage in Paul's epistles. Chapter 12. Romans 12 verse 1. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, and he, he listed them up in chapter 11 there, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, sanctified, set apart, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable what? Sir. Sir. It's reasonable to serve God. Mm -hmm. If you understand what Christ has done for you and all the wonderful blessings God has given us and is in store for us, over the course of time, especially, it should motivate you to not only worship God, but to serve him. It's your reasonable service. Go down to verse number 11. As he gives these instructions, he says, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit. And if you're, if you're fervent in spirit, look at the rest of that verse. Serving the who? The Lord. You know, what makes you fervent in spirit is getting God's word in your spirit. God's word is spiritual. So as you get God's word in your spirit, fervent has to do like being on fire, right? Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times we see people come and go. And what happens, the word of God, they haven't allowed the word of God. I say it like that because the word of God is powerful. They haven't allowed the word of God to put their spirits on fire. Because if your spirit is on fire, you're going to desire to serve the Lord. That's why we meet and get into the Word. Um, you serve God with your spirit. Go over to Romans, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. That's why Paul says this. People say, 
Brother Ron, over the years people say, did this guy here in 1 Corinthians 5 lose his salvation? You can't lose your salvation. God saves your soul everlasting. He gives it everlasting life when you trust Christ. But what is the issue at the judgment seat of Christ when this man uh, did this, these grievous sins of, of uh, having his father's wife? Look at 1 Corinthians 5, verse 5. Here's, here, was his, here was Paul's apostolic uh, judgment. To deliver such a one unto Satan. You know what he's saying? Just put him out of the fellowship because there's a protection amongst the saints. To deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. But notice the purpose of giving him over to Satan. That the spirit may be saved. In the day of the Lord Jesus. And people who don't understand rightly dividing God's word and don't understand God's grace, they're saying, see, if this guy doesn't recover himself, he won't be saved. He loses salvation. But notice that didn't say his soul. No. It says that the spirit, because <laughs> what's going to be judged there at the judgment seat of Christ is our spirit, what we've built up spiritually, what we've taken in spiritually, what we, how we served in our spirit. This man's soul is going to be saved. He's saved. He's with the Lord now. Where he's going to have a problem, if he didn't recover, although he did recover, 2 Corinthians 2. But he wasted a lot of time. His witness. Yeah, he, he is, exactly. His witness was destroyed. How, how sad is this? Thank God that he didn't put his name in here. He knows who he is and they know. But remember, this is the everlasting word of God. How sad to know that you are in the Bible and it's not for a good thing, at least here. In 2 Corinthians he recovers himself. If I'm him, I'm saying, thank you, Lord, for not putting my name on it. But there's another guy in Scripture. I just mentioned him earlier. His name is Demas. Demas is going to be forever known as forsaking the Apostle Paul. Do you want to be known for that forever? It's like, man, they're like, Demas. Yeah, there's the brother Demas. You're, no, you're famous. His name is fa it's popular. You're popular. You're famous. For forsaking our apostles. For the wrong reason. For the wrong reason. We don't want that. But so, we'll know this guy when we get there. Yeah, we'll know yeah, him when we get there. But you know what, Craig? He recovered himself. Yeah. He's an example of God's grace and mercy because he started off bad. Mm -hmm. Well, he actually started off good. He got saved. I, do, I even think he was probably a minister because it was a big deal what he was doing. He wasn't just like a regular person. He, he was affecting others is the point. But in 2 Corinthians, he, it's chapter 2, we'll see in our study in 2 mm -hmm. Corinthians. He did recover himself. Uh, go over to Philippians, if you will. Philippians chapter number 3. One more about serving God in your spirit. Or worshiping, serving God in your spirit. Notice in how Paul says in the Philippians. Now, Philippians is personally my favorite book of the Bible. Uh, Philippians chapter 3 is my favorite chapter. Because it's about pressing toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Okay? Check this out. Look at uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 3. For we are the circumcision. Now he's not talking about physical circumcision. He's talking about a, a spiritual circumcision and <clears throat> in in not made with hands. Cleansed. Cleansed. Yeah. Cut, cut, the cutting of the way of the sins of the, of, of the, of the body. Mm -hmm. Verse 3. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit, spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus. When he puts Christ first, there's his suffering and the glory that shall follow. And have no confidence in the flesh. Christ. You got to come to grips now, when I say you, us, that serving God is not going to be in our own strength. Mm -hmm. That's why we need the word of God, and that's why he gives us the spirit of God. Mm -hmm. But serving God is a spiritual service, okay? I wrote this, in our soul journey here on earth, we're to serve God by serving others. We're going to see that. The whole reason God left us here is to serve him by serving others. Um... I always say this, God could have taken us, the moment we trusted Christ, he could have taken us home to heaven. We would have been better off, quite frankly, right? But he doesn't look at it like that. He looks at it, now that I saved you, remember what Paul says? God gives us something so that we can then now go give it to another. And the greatest thing we can do, go to Galatians chapter 5. The, the greatest thing we can do as we're being sanctified is to use that sanctification, that edification that we built up to serve God by serving one another. That's how you serve the Lord. 
I was thinking about it. God doesn't need anything. He doesn't. What did Paul say in Acts 17? It's not like he need anything from man. So since God doesn't truly need us for anything, but he allows us to serve with him, labor with him, he's going to tell us, take that appreciation for me and put it to other people. Notice what he says here. Uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. Galatians 5, 13. You know the wonderful thing about God's grace? He gives, he gives us liberty, right? Freedom to serve. Not to sin, but to serve. Verse 13. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Every religion and every denomination wants to put this burden of bondage on you that if you don't do what they say or if you're doing other things that they say don't do, you, you may not be saved. You may not get to heaven. Well, Paul tells you right there, you got, you're saved. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Your brethren, you're free. Free not to sin. Only use, you to use the liberty as a tool. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the what? The flesh. Now Paul says all things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. Notice he says here, but by love serve one, one another. It's a pleasure to serve her. It, it, you know why? Because you have a fervent spirit, Dodie. Mm -hmm. You appreciate God's word. You take it in and you let it work. Mm -hmm. Some people put a, a guard and doesn't, don't let it. You remember what you said earlier? I won't go into detail, but you were saying, you, you were talking about someone very close to you who saw Christ. If they saw Christ in you, that was an and it was an offense to them. It was the offense of Christ. Mm -hmm. It rubbed them because their heart didn't want to submit to God's word. That's right. The people, the people are going to do that. Look at chapter 6, verse 10. As we have, therefore, opportunity. There's a service. As we have, therefore, opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Our own brothers and sisters are our number one priority. But that doesn't mean we don't serve the lost. Chris and I were on, at, at the health club yesterday, and we were on the treadmills, and I don't like working out at all. <laughs> but I got an extended workout because there was this guy right to her, her, her left, Nice guy, lost guy. He said he might come on Sunday. We'll see. <laughs> we had a nice long conversation. But he was, he calls himself a, a, a what do he call himself? A secular human, humanist, a secular humanist, and an agnostic. Ag and, and, agnostic. Agnostic. Religion is kindness. Oh my goodness. This guy was about 50 years old. He told me his religion is kindness. <laughs> and he was saying the most bizarre, crazy stuff. I was actually amused. And you know me. The way I can question him, and, and everywhere, everything he said, I just got him. It was, it was, I go, Krista watched it, and he said this, and he just he put himself in a pretzel. But at the end, we shook hands, gave each other a hug. He says, I said, I'm, I'm Pastor Ron, look me up, NorCal Grace and Carmichael, just, you just put it in there, you'll find me. He says, all right, I might be there. I said, come on. Because he, he was a very nice fellow, you know, but he was all confused. And sometimes, I just want to sit there with my wife and talk to her. But after a while, when this guy was, was talking, I was, I'm trying to help him. And I gave him the gospel of Christ. I asked him about who the Lord Jesus is. Does he believe in God? And he kind of believes in God, but really doesn't. Because when he said he believed in God, I said, well, God's going to hold you accountable for your sin. He said, no, people, are, we, we, he says, human beings aren't born, with, for, to, oh. aren't born with sin. I said, oh, yes, they Did are. Did you go to Genesis then? <laughs> no, I just asked, I said, I'll ask your wife. As soon as he said something like that about being kind all the time, I said, is your wife here? Because I'm going to ask her. He goes, oh, boy, yeah. yeah. He goes, well, you know, we have arguments and styles. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> but as I was doing that, I told Kristen, I said, I'm glad to do that. I don't get to do that a lot just to see the foolishness of lost man. As, as nice as he was, he was all confused. But you know what? Where is he going? Where's been getting this information from? Human viewpoint. That's right. That's, that's right. right. Exactly. And we and we just give him the power of God's word. But that's the way to serve. Go over to First Corinthians nine. That's what Paul is talking about over here. First Corinthians nine. So I did invite him. I hope he comes, because during the Q and A, I, I want him to ask questions about the word. He uh, he he been to he's been to Bible studies before. He goes. Uh, I didn't like. He goes. I didn't like it because they were too judgmental. They kept saying, "If you didn't trust in Jesus, you're gonna go to hell." <laughs> Says Muslims going to hell. Is that it? I said, "Well, you know, I'll talk to you about that when you come." Okay, I'll talk to you about that. 
Even though I did give him the gospel, I, I didn't want to give him too much. He was overwhelmed. overwhelmed. <laughs> Look at uh, 1 Corinthians 9, and down to verse 19, uh, 19. Paul says, see, he says, serve when I know. Even if you have opportunity to serve these lost people, give them the gospel. Verse 19, for though I be free from all men, Paul's not under the bondage of any man. He's the apostle. Yet have I made myself, what? Servant unto all. And why do you do it? That, that I, I might gain the more. The reason we want to give the gospel to these heathen, whether it's in verbal or, or give them gospel tracts, is so that we might gain them for the Lord Jesus. Verse 20, in Paul's day, and unto the Jews I became as a Jew. Paul was, Paul knew all, he was a Jew. He knew all the rules and regulations and rituals of the law. And when he was with them, he did it. Acts 21, they talked him into a Nazarite vow. He was going to offer a sacrifice. God's providence stepped in. He couldn't do it, but he was. He was, he was going to do it to prove to James and them that he was still their, their brother, okay? Their Jewish brother. Now, he did that that he might gain the Jews. Verse 20, to them that are under the law, that's the nation of Israel, as, as under the law. In other words, he did all those rituals and stuff. That I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, now that would be the Gentiles, as without law. He did not do all that Jewish ritual and customs amongst the Gentiles as to not be a stumbling block to them or influence them in a wrong way. To them, uh, like Peter did in Galatians 2, to them that are without law as without law, but he's not saying he's an outlaw, okay? He's, not, he's saying being not without law to God. He's saying I'm, I'm not just lawless now. But under the law to Christ, he's saying, I'm still doing this to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. And Paul sums it up. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. You know, Paul never lorded his, uh, his spiritual strength over people. He condescended to men of low estate. In other words, he, he knows how, who he was. And he was able to meet people right where they had not lorded over and be high, heady and high-minded. You know those professors? They're so smart, the intellectual, they just, you know, they, they look down on you. Paul didn't do that. Wherever you was, he got right back, right down there with you. Why? Because to those, those who were weak, he wanted to gain them. Mm -hmm. Verse 20, 22. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. And he sums it up. I am made all things to all men. Paul says, whoever comes to me, wherever they at, I'm going to meet them right there. Why? That I might by all means save some. He knew he wouldn't save all of them with the gospel, right. but he might save some, right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's what he means by serving, service. Uh, one more thing, too. Don't focus on the person who you're serving. What I mean by that is this. They're only human, as the song says, born of flesh and blood they're made. They're only human, born to make mistakes. Isn't that the song? Because if you focus on the person, they will eventually let you down is the point. Mm -hmm. Human, we, we're, all, we're all just men and women. We're male and female. We, we, we have sin in our members, even us believers. So if, you, if, you're, if you're serving someone, but you're focused on them, that's the wrong focus. Serve them focusing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Say, Lord, I'm doing this for you. Because right. if, you, if you don't, you're going to get frustrated because you, you're going to feel like they don't appreciate your service. Let me show you what Paul says. Go back a couple of chapters to chapter 7. In chapter 7, notice, notice what Paul says, verse 21. Chapter 7, 1 Corinthians 7, 21. Art thou called being a servant? Now, in the Roman Empire, you, you could be a servant, a ditcher servant. Care not for it. He said, if you get saved and you're a servant, don't worry about it. He said, but if thou mayest be made free, use it rather. In other words, if you can get free, get free legally, and then go, go on and use, that, use that, free, free, uh, that freedom. Verse 22, for he that is called in the Lord being a servant, I love this, is the Lord's free man. Can you imagine that? You're a servant, but you're the Lord's free man. He can use you right where you're at. Likewise, also he that is called being free is Christ's servant. You may be free and not under the bondage of indentured servitude, 
But hey, you're, you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. Serve him. Verse 23. I like this. Ye are bought with a price. And that price is his shed blood. Be not ye the servants of men. And when he says be not ye the servants of men, he's saying, look, you're going to serve men for the Lord's sake, but they're really not the issue, right? If you're putting your focus on uh, sinful man, they're going to let you down. Always remember you're serving the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? That's what he means by be not ye the servants of men. Um, now, there's three ways that your service is manifested. As you're sanctified to serve, there's three ways that the Bible talks about. That's what we're going to look at with our time we have left here. 25 minutes. And it's a simple thing. You've heard of it. It's your time. Mm -hmm. Your talent. And it's just to sum it up. And your treasure. These are the three ways that the Bible talks about serving the Lord. Being part of what he's doing in the world. And so let's look at that. Your time. Your time is, is summed up basically your, just your, your physical presence. Your physical presence. That means the world to Almighty God because it brings comfort. Okay? Your attendance here, excuse me. Your attendance here means the world to my family and I. Because it comforts us, it encourages us. Giving your time. You know, you think about children. Um, children don't need a lot of things from their parents. The most valuable thing parents can give their children outside of the Word of God is their time. That's it. They want your time. They want your time. We remind Jada Lynn how blessed she is to have two grace-believing parents because she's able to get our time. She's homeschooled. Um, she gets a lot of time with mom and dad. And we tell a lot of children don't get that. They are away from their parents they, they, they're away from their parents from 8.30 a.m. to probably 6.30, 7 o'clock in the evening. Away from their parents. They spend more time with their teachers than their parents. So time is precious. And your physical presence, uh, go, go to you know, we're in 1 Corinthians, go over to 2 Corinthians. Let me show you how important that is. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2. The Apostle Paul, rarely does he get down as far as in, 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 in despair. He, he, he has no rest in his spirit. <clears throat> but when he did, it was because other people were suffering hardships. Even though he knew that was part of, uh, of, of being in Christ, suffer for his sake, it's still not easy to know people are hurting. As a minister, I hear from people every day and many of it, it's, it's what I share with you, is, you know, we appreciate the ministry, but they also are suffering, especially if they don't have anybody else who believes this truth. And it gets on your heart. So Paul suffered that. But also, when he, he didn't know where his brethren were, how they were doing. Notice here in chapter 2, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. 2 Corinthians 2, 12. Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel... And a door was opened unto me of the Lord. I mean, Paul says this one was set up right on the tee for me. Sometimes you got a battle heart. Other times it's right there for you. That was this one. But something was going on in his spirit. That's where he serves the Lord. Now watch. I had no rest in my spirit. You know the reason why? Because I found not Titus my brother. But taking my leave of them, I went from thence unto Macedonia. Do you know, because he did not know, see Titus, he, didn't, he couldn't find him, he couldn't rest. Paul couldn't rest. You know, Kristen and I, we talk about probably the worst thing for a parent is one of your children go missing and you don't know where they at or what happened to them. How do you even sleep or eat or even go on with life if that happens? Because every, every moment you wonder, what's going on with my little girl? Uh, Kristen and I had a scare, you know, once. We took Jada Lynn uh, out to... Santa Clara, where the uh, 49ers played. This was super, during Super Bowl, uh, when they had Super Bowl there a couple of years ago. San Francisco. Oh, it was in San Francisco. San Francisco. Oh, it was in San Francisco. You're right. Okay, they played in San Francisco. We were in San Francisco. And it was like the, the Super Bowl experience, Super Bowl 50, I think. There's all these people, you know. How they, well, there was a big playground they had right there. This is in the Barcadero out there. Anyway, and it was a big playground. All these children were playing. We kept our eye on them, keep our eye on them. There's children everywhere, people everywhere. And we said, don't go anywhere without letting us know, right? 
So we must have turned, and I mean, it was a split second and whew, gone. We didn't see the, we couldn't find her. Turns out she had, because she, she was six, she ran off following some other little girls to play and went into the other side or something we couldn't find. And we were in a panic. And, I, and then my problem was now my wife is panicking. <laughs> so I'm worried about where my child is. And Chris was like, turned, I was like, it was, it was the worst feeling in the world. And so we, we saw her, she was playing. We said, don't, why didn't you go anywhere? We said, well, they wanted me to play with them over there. I said, we got to tell her. So, you know, we had the whole, it was hard. But, how long were you in the pan? Ooh, how long did it take her to find them? <laughs> It was a long five minutes. Yeah. It was a long five minutes, let's just say That's that. That's how Mary and Joseph felt. Yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. Days. Oh, well, you know what? Theirs was worse because they had went days. Right, right. You know what? That's right, Dodie, exactly. Mm -hmm. they, 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 now, he was older. Yeah. He was 12 years old. And but I said, still, they but were still, parents. Still, they were their parents. <laughs> oh, if, if, if he was 22 and they didn't know where he was, they would be worried, right? right? But can you imagine as a parent and you don't know where your child is, there's no, I mean, you, how do you even go on? Like, you, you just don't go through your regular days. Ah, no, it's like you can't eat or can't sleep. Well, the Apostle Paul was that way with saints whom he loved and who loved him. And someone as, as uh, special like Titus, by the way, he says, my brother. And remember what we learned about brothers. Brothers are born for adversity. Anytime Paul needed something done, Titus was there. Uh, Mark is here. He says, I could be your Titus, Ron, <laughs> in a situation. I said, that's good. Mark would come tell him. He said, I'll be your Titus. There you go. Because when you need something done, you got to have Titus. But you know what? I can see how the Apostle Paul felt. He had no rest in his spirit. Because physical presence, just time spent with others. You know what Paul would say? Luke, the beloved physician, is with me. Demas forsook me. He left. Only Luke is with me. His physical presence. Just being there for the Apostle Paul comforts him. And I want to say, just being there for your brothers and sisters in Christ, particularly that's why a local assembly exists, so you can be there. That's one way to serve God. The Word of God is going to teach you. Paul always talks about, check this out, about face-to-face. -face. Um, go over to Colossians chapter, yeah, go over to Colossians chapter 2. You ever wonder why Paul would say things like this? Colossians chapter 2. Oh, by the way, I get, I get, uh, I got a, I, I didn't tell you this. I, yesterday I got an email from a guy in India. Oh, yeah, you did. Oh, I did? Okay, good. I don't know. I guess I, sometimes I should. He, he says, we want you to come to India <laughs> to teach the word of God. I'm like, I could barely get down to Southern California <laughs> once a year I mean, and back to Minnesota. And I, 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 I appreciate the sentiment. And I'd say, you know, if it works out, it works out. But, um, yeah, that one's going to be a long shot because I got so many saints in, a, in the United States who I have, I would go to first, New York and this, that, and the other. Southern California, Minnesota, those are our number one um, priorities. But I would love to go all around the country once a, once a month and minister live. People ask me all the time. I wish we had the, f the funds, the finances, the t time and stuff. When I win the lottery. Yes, no, <laughs> that would be just the travel fund. Because I, for real though, I, we would go to every one of these places, just do a conference. Maybe they have paid over there. Well, yeah, so, well, yeah he, they would have to. India, that's a long way, but it costs a lot. Yeah, thousands of dollars just, to, just for the plane ticket. But you know what? Uh, but I, I have to take care of home first is my point. I'm one who takes care of home first. Mm -hmm. I would take care of the saints in the United States first. But um, I, I, I'll see. We do have some. Here's the good thing. We do have brothers who have ministries over in India. I'm going to tell him about Brother Dan, uh, Dan Gross and those guys who go to India every year. So I'm going to hook him up with Dan is what I'm going to do. Yeah. So we got people over there that can take care of him. Uh, anyway, but I, I would love to go, to go see saints. You know why? Because I realize that the physical presence means something. Look what Paul says in Colossians chapter 2. Paul could write letters to people, but there was nothing like seeing them face to face. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. Colossians chapter 2, verse 1. For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea, that was a neighboring city. Mm -hmm. Now watch what he says. And for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. Now, why, why would Paul talk about his face in the flesh? Because he knew his very presence 
amongst these saints would encourage them and encourage them in their walk with the Lord. Just his very presence would help them be edified. Just his physical presence would comfort them and edify them. And Paul always wanted that. He wanted to make his way. All those apostolic journeys. Thank you. Dodi, 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 uh, make these up. Now I'm putting it on there. Dodi and people. Huh? One. Oh, yeah. This one. They say first, the life of the Apostle Paul. They say missionary journeys, first, second, and third. But really, it's apostolic journeys. Oh, I don't. Uh, the, yeah. Can I see that, Dodi? Do you know one of the reasons why Paul continually went to all of these places, not just to set up churches, he did that, but he always went back to encourage them and strengthen them. Mm -hmm. Now, I want you guys to understand, they did have the spiritual gifts. They had to get the Holy Ghost and so they could get information. God would give it to them. Paul knew his, his physical presence would encourage them. It would keep them strong for the fight. And the Apostle Paul he went, he went back and forth, back and forth, through perilous times and perilous situations so that he might see people in, they could see him face to face, okay? Mm -hmm. He knew the importance of just his physical time, okay? That's Thank what you it says here, mm -hmm. to encourage to, them. Oh, it does, in your, exactly, yeah. that's exactly right. Uh, look, look at a couple more of those. Um, look at chapter number, go back to uh, 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, if you will. You know, I was encouraged. Uh, I saw this thing. There was this. Uh, there was a dad. It was called a dad's breakfast, a, a daddy's breakfast, and it was a community. With six hundred men. Still. Well, can I can I give the story? <laughs> can I set it up, mother? Yes. Yeah, just, oh, sorry. But 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 it, sorry. It, it makes more sense if I set it up because yeah, it, not it, yeah. She's right, six hundred men. But here's I got to set it up because it's going to make more sense. The community was a mixed community of whites and blacks, right? Many of the young white men had their fathers, because it was called daddy, it was daddy and son breakfast. Mm -hmm. But many of the young black men didn't have their fathers. Uh -oh. So they put out, a, a, a local minister put out a call on Facebook for men. He says, we need 50 men to come and be mentors to these young men who don't have fathers. Oh. Now what happened, mother? Not 50 showed up. <laughs> She's right. She was so excited. Now we can set it up. Not 50 men showed up. 600 men oh, in the community goodness. showed up. 600 for these black boys. men. Well, all type no, of men. It was, it was all, every national. Every, nas every national. Oh. Yeah. Just, it was just a lot of the young black men didn't have, but all type of men. Okay. Men just said, they, they just answered the call. The guy who, who put the, the call out, he says, I was... He, he said, when I got to the place, there wasn't a place to park. It was so many cars. He's like, was something else going on? He only needed 50. He asked for 50. He got 600 men to respond. Wow. That's awesome. There because you know. these men know, if, if you're just in these young men's life, just be a mentor, it can give them a chance in life. They know because they, know. they probably didn't have a dad. Many of them said that. They interviewed this one black man. He, he's in his 30s. He says, re, he says, the reason I'm here is because I didn't have my father growing yeah. up. And I didn't want... I, I wanted to mentor somebody else. That's great. Yeah. yeah. He said he didn't want any of those young men to feel that, yeah. and he wanted to be there. And and these men are now in these young men's lives, you know, mentoring them. They need that. Right. It's just all these boys. Check this out. One guy, he owns a clothing business. You know what he did? He took all these little twelve-year-old boys and thirteen-year-old boys. He brought ties, oh. neckties. He says, look, you need a man to show you how to mm -hmm. tie this necktie so that when you go out in the business world. Mm -hmm. And he, he sat and went to all of them like oh. a, a metal around, and he, he showed them how to do it, each and every one of them, just like that. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. It is Because awesome. a, a boy need a man to teach him those things, right? Mm -hmm. Anyway, that was wonderful. They gave their time. And just being there... I guarantee it changed a lot of those young guys' lives. Oh, you bet. Forever. You bet. Forever, yep. So, so time. Um, look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 17. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 17. 
One of the things Satan did was to kick, try to kick Paul out of places so he couldn't be there and encourage people, right? Mm -hmm. Look what he said here. Remember he got kicked out. In, in Acts 17, he got kicked out of Thessalonica. Mm -hmm. Notice what happened. Verse number 17. But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in what? Presence. Mm -hmm. Not in heart. Not in heart, though. His heart was with him. Mm -hmm. Endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. Mm -hmm. Paul knew that by the authorities, they actually put a bounty on him and so forth, or, or they were going to take uh, Jason's home. They, were, they, they put a, a, a bounty on Jason. They said, if we see Paul, we're going to take all your possessions. But Paul understood that his physical presence was needed there. So even though he had to leave, he always had them on his heart, and he always wanted to get back. That's important. He knew just his time, his physical presence. Um, one more. Look at chapter 3, verse 10. Chapter 3, verse 10. Look, look at this verse. I know you read this. That's what I want to do is bring this to life. Night and day, praying exceedingly. Do you know what Paul was praying? That we might see your what? Face. Face. Pardon me. I can't talk about fathers, okay? I can't, get, I can't do it. The, probably the best day of my life was meeting my biological father, buddy. That was, that was the best day of my life. I hugged him, and I felt like the little boy. Mm -hmm. And I worked together since I was about one and a half, almost two. The little boy came out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't expecting that. Mm -hmm. And I was, thank God, Krista recorded it. And for like a minute, I held on to him like a little boy. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Look what Paul says. I hadn't seen my father's face. At least I did not, not since I was one. I don't remember. Look at this. Look, look how important that is. Verse 10. Night and day, praying exceedingly that we might see your face. And then when he gets there, and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. So he didn't just come there so they can have, you know, breakfast together. Right. He's also going to have a study with them, you know. Right. But he understood the importance of just face-to-face -face contact, seeing them, his physical presence. You see verse like that, when I read that, I said, over the years I say, wow, Paul just wanted to see them. Look at them face-to-face. Because there's a spiritual dynamic that God made face-to-face. -face. Yeah. You can read their countenance. You can read their countenance. That's why face-to-face -face negotiations is always best. It's easy to write stuff that you might regret on, on social media and stuff. But if you're face-to-face -face with someone, you hear the tone of their voice, their count, you see the countenance. Even if, even if you guys are dis in disagreement, there's a different body language that goes when you're in person. You know that? That's why I tell people, don't ever go back and forth with people online. That's stupid. You, it, it never happened. You don't, you don't, it's not the right dynamic. It's, it's way better on the phone. At least you hear their voice. But the best is always to meet in person. God made it that way. Time. He wanted to meet to see their face. Now, the next thing, as we, we got a couple minutes, is your talent or your unique gifts and skills and passions. We're all different. But God wants us all to use who we are to serve the saints. Uh, go over to Ephesians. Get, get Ephesians chapter number 4. Ephesians chapter 4, and look at verse 15. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 15. But speaking the truth in love. I was, we were talking with uh, a sister here, uh, Brother Rod's wife. And she was asked, yeah, she, yeah Gail, I, and I should have said her name since I put his name in it. I was, and this was, um, we were talking about a family member. Oh, no, we were talking about, the, this was the one about the Jehovah's Witness. We, we have good discussions with them. It's about the Jehovah's Witness and, and receiving their material. And she said, in essence, she receives their material. You know, they, they give you this thing called a watchtower because she didn't want to hurt their feelings. And... I said, we should not be worried about hurting people's feelings when they're in error. What I mean by that, we don't, we won't, we're not trying to, we're not trying to offend them and hurt them, 
But this verse about speaking the truth in love, mm -hmm. it's loving to tell someone when they're in error when it comes to the spiritual things. It's, mm -hmm. not, it's not loving to, just not to hurt their feelings. And she got it. She's, look at verse 15. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into, into him. See, it's about the Lord Jesus in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Now notice this. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted. It's like a compact. By, now, now notice how it's done, everybody. You, gotta, you play a part in this. By that which every joint supplieth. That every joint supply, that has to do with saints. As we join together, that's what that means. It's a joining together. We all do our part according to the effectual working and the measure of every part. We all play a part. Make it increase of the body. That's how the body is built up until the edifying of itself in love. What he's saying is everybody needs to play their part. And when everybody pulls their own weight and play their part, it helps build up the body of Christ. Go over to um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 12, look what Paul says about how God made the body, the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit, this is, our, this is our baptism, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, over in Galatians says male or female, and hath been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath, now here's what I want you to see, but now hath God set the members, every one of them in the body, as it has pleased who? Mm -hmm. Him. If you're a member of the body of Christ, you have a purpose and you're part of a, a plan that God has. He put you here to please him. What sanctification is, it's getting God's word in you and it will motivate you to use your, I didn't put that on there. That's, this is your, your unique, because everyone is unique, individual, your unique your person, yeah, your person, who you are as a person, um, your skills, gifts, talents, all those things, who you are. We all different. Your, but God wants measure of faith. Yes. Well, that one, you 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 are who you are anyway. What God's word does, he 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 allows you to use that for his good. Right. The reason he chose Saul, for example, Paul, is because Paul's passion. For what he thought was true was greater than anyone else's. He was leading the rebellion when he thought he was serving God, right? He said, I serve God pure conscience. So Jesus Christ, our Lord, saw that passion and said, I can use that passion, but for my glory. Absolutely. He didn't change who Paul was. He was the same guy. He just put him on the right road, not the road to Damascus. He didn't spare the suffering either. No, he didn't. He, you know, Paul had to do that because of what he did. But you know what I'm saying? He used the same personality, the energy Paul, everything that who Paul was, Saul, and he used it for good. Right. God don't want you to change yourself. No, he, doesn't. He, doesn't. he doesn't. He wants you to be you, but God doesn't change your personality. He changes your character. He, 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 um, he, cleans, he cleanses it up. Be yourself, but be it, <laughs> not like a sister said, I'm just going to be myself. Which, man, I'm going to be mean to everybody. I remember that. <laughs> no, don't be mean. Use that, that fire and energy you got and serve the Lord with it. That's what we do. So be yourself. Your unique gifts, talent. That's, that's serve. You can serve the Lord in that way. You can do things I can't do and vice versa, right? We all, we all have different, we play a different part. Now, the last thing, as we end in about a few, couple minutes, is the treasure. Go back to Romans 15. He calls that service. 
Go back to Romans chapter 15. Uh, that's part of your service. In fact, Paul uses that as service. Uh, Romans chapter 15, as Paul went and took a collection of, of money for the poor saints of Jerusalem. Uh, Romans 15, verse 31. He, saw, he, he says, pray for him. I remember, I remember this at a conference about 12, 13 years ago, a grace conference, and the, guy, the brother, one brother said, Paul never told anybody to pray for him. I said, are you crazy? He did. I know his point was, we, when we have people pray for us, it's like, oh, did God give me this, that, that, you know, little thing. What he meant was, Paul wasn't so worried about material things and stuff. But Paul asked people to pray for him all the time. Of course. It was the type of prayers. Look at verse number 29, uh, verse 30. He says it. You know I remember verses. So as soon as that brother said that, I go, oh, Lord, don't say that, man. Because as soon as somebody says something, my brain kicks in and says, oh, no, the word, no, the word says he does. Here it is. I sing about this verse. Now I beseech you, brother, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake. By the way, it's, it's hard to be a preacher and pastor if you don't really know all of the, these verses. Because you're going to always ask somebody who knows that they're going to say, hey, you made that statement, but this verse said the opposite. That's a hard thing right there. Okay? Or you better, if you are a pastor, you better be, yeah, there it is. Okay, I made a mistake. Verse 30. Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. Mm -hmm. Paul says, pray for me, man. That I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea. Those are the Jews that's trying to kill them. And that my service, which I have for Jerusalem, may be accepted of the saints. Those are poor saints of Jerusalem, the little flock, who sold all. They sold all, waiting for the king to come with his kingdom. God changed the program to dispensation of grace, their money. They became poor saints of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Paul, that, 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 that collection of money that Paul had, he called service. Go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9. It does it again there. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 12. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 12. Speaking of this same uh, um, service, he says, For the administration of this service not only supplieth the want of the saints, so it took care of the, the want of those poor saints, but guess what else it did? But, but is abundant also by many thanksgiving unto what? Who? God. Those saints... When they receive this relief, because they say, Lord, we sold all. We did what you said. Now we have nothing. God says, I got it. And in his wisdom, he had Paul go through all these Gentile churches. What did he say in Romans 16? If the Gentiles have been partakers of their spiritual things, speaking of the Jews, then it is their duty to give back in these carnal things. And you know what? They said, thank you, God, for providing for our needs. God, God told them to sell everything. And if he tells them to sell everything and they do it, he's going to provide for them. And he did. Now, uh, look at Philippians chapter 2. Just a few more verses. And we'll end. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verse 30. This is Brother Epaphroditus. He, he was a laborer for the Apostle Paul uh, to the point where he was sick nigh unto death. God had mercy on him. Uh, the, the, the Exodus 33, mercy. He didn't die, God kept him alive. Now, verse number uh, 29, Philippians chapter 2, verse 29, receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness. Oh, if you know the story, they wanted to see him. And Paul says he's sick, but I'm going to send him carefully. It was treacherous traveling in those days. But check this out. They wanted to see him. He wanted to see them. And I guarantee you, when he got there to see his, his people, he was, he was from Philippi, it made his, he, it, it not only affected his spirit, uplifted his spirit, I, I bet his physical condition got a little better. It was a comfort to see his people he longed for. Now, notice this. Receive him with all gladness, verse 29, and hold such in reputation. This guy was somebody to point to and say, look, that man served the Lord. Verse 30, because for the work of Christ, he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life, to supply your lack of what? Service toward me. And what he was doing is, when they could not take, didn't they, when they stopped taking care of the Apostle Paul, this one man took up the slack. Okay? 
Uh, we'll see that in chapter 10. Go to chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 10. We're almost done. I'm just going to get these on, on record. Chapter 4, verse 10. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. And then down to verse number 15. Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. Uh, Dodie, you know Lydia, yes. the Lydia's house, mm -hmm. the first church at Philippi, Lydia's house. When Paul left Macedonia, that's where Philippi is, those ladies and those men who came after that, they took up a collection and said, here the Apostle Paul, take this with you on your journeys. And they, they were the only ones at that time right. providing for him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. I look at verse 18. But I, uh, verse 17, not because I desire a gift. The reason why I say it's a service because <clears throat> it's fruit abound to your account. That's right. Not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. Right. When, you, when you invest your time, your talent, and your treasure, it's fruit abounding to your account. Right. Uh, Brother King David, the singer, songwriter, musician, he has a beautiful song called Fruit lovely fruit, fruit that may abound to your account. He wrote a song of that. Verse 18, but I, I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. So even your treasure given in the right place has to be in the right place. And in the grace message, in Paul's message, it is a way to serve the Lord. Um, we're going to end, but what I want you to see is that all of this is for our reward. We, we serve the Lord. He sanctifies us to serve him, but our service has an end. <laughs> and what that is, is the reward of the inheritance. Uh, get two passages. Get Colossians 3 and Romans 16. We'll end. Colossians 3 and Romans 16. Colossians chapter 3 and Romans chapter 16. Why do we serve the Lord? Well, it's right. It's reasonable. But he's so wonderful, he gives us even more incentive. Yes, we serve him, serve him, worship and serve him because we love him. We should. But he's so gracious, he gives us even more. And what's that? The, a, a, a chance to reign with him forever in the heavenly places. Look at Colossians chapter 3, verse number 23. Colossians 3.23, and whatsoever ye do, do it heartily, or with all your heart, as he says in Ephesians. As to the Lord, the righteous judge, remember I said don't focus on the man? Don't focus on men, and not unto men. In other words, don't make men your focus, your service is for the Lord, okay? But know something, verse 24, knowing that of the Lord, and why is he called him Lord? The righteous judge, the judgment seat of Christ is in view. Ye shall receive the reward of of the inheritance, not the inheritance. You receive an inheritance the moment you're saved. You're an heir of God, Ephesians. This is being a joint heir with Christ. You receive the reward of the inheritance. That's to reign with him. For ye serve the Lord Christ. But what if you don't serve the Lord Christ? Look at verse 25. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which we, he had done. And there is no respect of persons. People are crazy if they think every member of the body of Christ is going to be a joint heir with Christ. If you do wrong, you're not reigning with Christ. You want to know how? Look at, let's end in Romans 16. There were some men who were brothers and they didn't serve the Lord Jesus Christ. They're not going to reign with Christ. They're not joint heirs with Christ. Look at Romans 16, verse 17. We'll end. Romans 16, verse 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which, not you, Mark, not Mark. <laughs> Not our Mark. He's a good man. Identify. Identify and point out. Mark them which cause divisions and offenses. You know what a denomination is? You know what a numerator and denominator? Mm -hmm. That's to do division. Denominations are divisions. Mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine, that's the mystery doctrine of Paul, which ye have learned and will do what? Avoid them. 
For they that are such serve not who? Our Lord Jesus Christ. They are not serving our Lord Jesus Christ. They are serving something, aren't they? Remember how I started off? They worship and serve in something? Guess what they worship and serve? Their own belly. Can this be true of some pastors? Yes. I'd say it's true of most pastors, Doey. You know what belly, belly is? Is your carnal desires. Mm -hmm. what's, what's, your, what's your most basic desire as mankind? If, if you get locked up, if you don't, if the, the God put in mankind, the most basic desire of mankind is to eat, to survive. You can go without a lot of things. You can go without a roof over your head. You can go, if you can go without a lot, what you can't go a long way out without is food. That's what Paul says, the belly was made for me. What, when they serve in themselves, it's talking about their own carnal desires. They're, they're like beastly desires. Filthy lucre. You know, that's who they serve. They don't serve our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, let's end. Verse 18. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but, our own, but their own belly. And by good words. Oh, over in Philippians 3, he says their God is their belly. You know that verse in Philippians 3? Their God. Check this out. They worship and serve their belly. Their God is their belly. Their carnal desires. And by good words, they sound very good. They're very articulate. And fair speeches. These guys can put on a show up there, eloquent show. They deceive the hearts of the simple. God doesn't want us to remain simple. The reason why we're sanctified or to be sanctified is so that we can be built up in God's holy word in order to serve him. And by you giving your time, your talent, and your treasure in this life towards the grace message. God has a reward of the inheritance of reigning with Christ in the next life. It starts with salvation. If you, if you never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you can do that now. The Lord Jesus Christ shed his blood on Calvary's cross for your sins. And if you're saved today, let's get busy being sanctified and serving. The Lord is worthy of it. Let's do it. We'll help you with that here at Northern California Grace Fellowship. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time together tonight. We thank you that we can get into your holy word, learn, uh, 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 learn how to be sanctified in it, set apart unto you as holy. But also, that sanctification should lead us to serving you, worship and serving you, and not ourselves or others. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for that, um, the greatest example of that, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the second greatest example, our Apostle Paul. May we walk in the footsteps of our Apostle as, as men and women, male and female, in the body of Christ, serving you, Father. Thank you for the opportunity to do that with, these, with those of like precious faith here. We pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ who don't have others that they can fellowship with at this time. Thank you that we can come to them, even like this tonight, uh, through the blessing of technology. Thank you for, we pray for them that your grace and mercy comforts them. So, Father, until we meet again uh, Sunday, if, we tarry, if the Lord tarries, we say thank you for allowing us to be a part of what you're doing. We ask all of this in the name of your Son, the precious Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ.